Okay, propose that we get started. Um, we're a little bit in a weird configuration. Most of the presenters are remote, so we'll see many, many people on the screen. And then we are, we are conflicted against a, a, a buff, so um, it's a bit, a bit of a strange situation, but it doesn't matter. Uh, Pascal, could you get the first slides? So I'm using the, the agenda to, to click. People used to it, so when you're on the agenda main page, you can. When you're in the agenda main page, you can click on 60s. You get this 60s material. So you've got the agenda, and then you've got the documents. You just click on one, and you can start. Okay, so welcome to the 60s work group meeting. Uh, this is an ITF meeting, so I need to remind you of the. Note well, the note well applies to this as it applies to any ITF meeting. If you're discussing any IPR, whether it's yours or not, you need to disclose it. If you have any questions, read this note well. Uh, go through different uh, references in this note well and ask your favorite work group chair or, or AD. Um, reminder, we are taking minutes. Uh, where, is our, where are our minute takers? Dominique should be somewhere. Federico is here. Thank you. Um, so if you could take the lead, and then Dominique will, will, will jump in and, and, and fill in. We're recording, uh, and all of this will be sent to the mailing list after the meeting. We will circulate some blue, blue sheets as well. So trivial stuff. Uh, minutes are here. Uh, remote participation. Meeting materials are online, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're going uh, one set of slides per presentation makes it much simpler for us. This is the agenda of today. Um, so, as I as I told you, most of the presenters will be remote, which is a kind of a, a weird situation. But we'll start by doing some intro and status, uh, agenda bashing, milestones, and state. We then go into a first um, half, which will be about chartered items. Uh, Chavi will present the six-star protocol. Malisha will present the minimal security solution. Michael uh, will present the zero touch join, and then Diego SFX. And then we'll go, if time permits, into the uncharted items. We have about half an hour for that. With Tengfei and uh, minimal scheduling function, we'll have uh, SF1 uh, with Remy here, and then Michael again. Oops, that's good. Excuse me. Michael with a uh, joint priority. And then at the end, we have 10 minutes of non scheduled space for any other business. If there's any updates, uh, then, then this is where we want them. So before we get started, is there any any comments about this agenda? Anything we want to add, we want to remove, we want to discuss, we don't want to discuss? If you have any issues, please raise them now. OK, I hear nothing. So let me um, give you a quick uh, status, uh, the milestones. So w while I'm speaking, Chavi, you'll be the first presenter. So I don't know how, what do you need to Click on some magic, but but uh, you'll be speaking. Will he show up in the queue? Is that how it works? Okay. I think I think uh, Miteko somehow magically scheduled him. We'll see. Um, so we've uh, completed the initial uh, submission of the six top protocol, the six six P to the ASG a couple of days ago, and it was just transitioned from uh, submitted to under and. Um, I forget what the what the term is, but but it it was it was accepted and is, is looked is looked at by the ASG, ASG. So we should have some reviews rolling in in the next couple of weeks. Um, I wanted to take a, a minute or so to this is a rather dense slide. I, I had 14 hour flight just now, so this is this is what 14 hours of flight gives you. Uh, lots of colors and arrows and stuff. What I, what I want to show you is a, a state of the of the working group, and 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 bear with me. I'll, I'll try and read this with you. So. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, uh, we have uh, completed a minimal six-dish solution, which is a uh, fantastic news. Um, everything works. Uh, we can now go out and build fully standards-compliant six-dish products. And by minimal six-dish, I mean six-dish minimal, six-dish minimal security, minimal scheduling function, of course. Sorry, we can, we can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Ripple uh, 6550. And six low band, so that's 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 great. It's the first time that I mean we're 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 there now. We have uh, 
everything, uh, we have a solution, a minimal solution that works. And I think as a working group, we have two different um, elements to work on, uh, something internal within the IETF and something external. Let me start with the external. Um, you know, as a working group, it's important that we support adoption of this technology uh, throughout the market. And so there's a number of uh, actions that are going on right now, not within the ITF, but a little bit on, on the fringe. Uh, performance evaluation, questions like, is 6 the right technology for my application? Is what, uh, what, what implementers are asking themselves? And so uh, all of these open source implementation now support 6 uh, Contiki NG, which is like three days old, is the last one that was... Uh, that was, uh, that was announced, that's great. And there's a bunch of activity going on in performance evaluation benchmarking, which is exactly what we need. We need to be able to tell you know, um, uh, company X, Y, and Z uh, whether for this particular application, Sixish will, will work. And there's also tools that have been built around conformance and interop testing, such as FNDrop, so it's, uh, it's, it's a good thing. Now, internally to the, to, the, to, the, to the working group, internally to the IETF, uh, there's, based on this minimal 6 uh there's further technology developments in three areas. The first area is additional scheduling functions. So there's three ongoing works, SFX, ASF, and SF1. The ones that have a star are the ones that are presented today. Uh, a second focus point is security uh, with the zero-touch joint security. So taking the one-touch solution of minimal security and turning that into a zero-touch solution. Michael will present this. And then a number of optimizations uh, regarding Ripple, regarding EVs, uh, joint priority, uh, elements that you put in the DIOs, elements that you put in the EV to make joint faster, uh, more flexible, things like this. Um, and so these are, these are this is ongoing work right now in the, in the work group. Now, as a working group, we need to make sure that we have some criteria uh, for extending the minimal six-ish um, solution with different uh, additional, additional ongoing work. And so we, we, we've been, we're thinking uh, about what those criteria could be. This is not a, this is not a final list, obviously, but it kind of, uh, kind of gives you an idea of, of the state of mind we're in. So uh, if, you're, if you're working on something that goes and, and adds stuff to minimal 6 dish, um, is the specification that you're writing, what exact problem is it solving? Um, once that specification is in place in the implementation, how much better will the network work compared to minimal security, minimal 6 dish? And then, and then, you know, if you pull in a bunch of uh, RFCs, then how much bigger will the footprint be of your implementation? Because that's something we, we cannot forget as well. So this concludes, I think, this... Uh, before you leave this slide, um, I wanted to, to um, say that in the last uh, Ripple and EB optimization, uh, this is the continuation of a long story at 6 dish where we've been looking at things which are needed for the broad picture, writing down initial papers or documents inside 6 stage to make sure that's what we want, and then go to different groups to get the work done because the work belongs elsewhere. And in, in this list, you see that there is DIO, which belongs to repo. There is fast reroute, which also belongs to repo. And those are things that we start here but will, know, will not do here. We'll be asking, for instance, in us for, for role, uh, about those DIOs and, and fast reroute things. Um, some things which deal with the extended beacons may be done to some point here, and maybe discussing with Charlie and Bob in this room, we might decide that this is going to end in IEEE, I don't know. Right. First, we need to, to, to solidify, clarify the idea, and then we see if it has to happen and where it has to happen. So, so it's not because it's in this list that we want the whole work to happen here. We have a long story of doing things at Roll, at Six Low, etc., which started here. That, that was it. So. Any, any remarks about this before we move on? All right, then I propose that we get started with our uh, pretty dense agenda. Uh, and Xavi will give us an update about the six top protocol. Is is the note taking going well? Federico, could you yeah. could you log in? Okay, Dominique as well. You're all good. Uh, Xavi, the floor is yours. Uh, let us know when you want to uh, flip slides. I think that's the easiest. Okay. So hello everybody. Good afternoon. Good morning from here. Um, I'm I'm gonna explain a little bit what we did with the 6P Xavi? protocol. Yeah. 
can you please put your mic further? It seems that the, the, all the rooms have the, have the sound very loud. Even further than that's going to work. Farther, like this? Yes, it's, it's better. OK. So I'm going to go through the 6P protocol. And I'm going to give just a status update of what's going on with it. So next slide. This is a very stable uh, draft. Um, it, uh, we are now in version 9. And uh, we didn't go back, please. Can you go one slide back? back? Yeah. This is the first slide, Shavit. Uh, because I see, I see the second one. Now, this one, sorry. Oh, oh. So we addressed the comments we received uh, in the mailing list. And then we did several uh, improvements, basically for readability, fixing minor typos, and so on. And then we clarified three, the three points that we think that from the comments were not clear. So this first one is relocation. And there was a thread in the mailing list as well discussing that. The second one is how we handle inconsistencies. And the third one is uh, the error codes. And, and uh, we try to clarify at least the, the error codes and how they are used. And this draft was submitted, submitted to the ISG. Uh, since the 31st of October. So now I think is in review status. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So the first thing we did is um, we tried to clarify relocation. The important thing uh, for relocation is that um, we we submit uh, this uh, this command and with this command there's two lists. One is the one is the the cells that want to be relocated, and the other one is a candidate list. Uh, one thing that was not clear is that the cells in the candidate list are all them equivalent. This means that any of, uh, and, and you will see it in these examples, but uh, it means that any cell can be er relocated to any of the candidate cells. And if we look, for example, at the case A, where uh, we have here an example where all the cells are, are, are relocated, we will see that uh, there are two proposed cells, and the first one is much, it, it can be relocated to uh, uh, the last one in the candidate cell list, while the, the second one that needs to be relocated is relocated to uh, the first one in the cell list. And this is just a decision on the implementation because all of them are equivalent. Um, we have other examples like case B, where only one cell from the from the two that want to be relocated is relocated, or in the case C, when none of them can be relocated. And here we can see how uh, how the protocol works and what is the, the signaling we have. Next slide, please. Yeah, so then we try to clarify inconsistency handling. Previously, we had uh, in the header, um, a counter, we call it generation, but then after in the last ITF, we had extensive discussions on whether that field is is needed or not. And at the end, we, we decide to, to just remove that field and go with the sequence number and, and with the sequence number being able to identify when there's an inconsistency. To be clear, an inconsistency is when uh, when the cells in, in the schedule of two nodes, A and B, are not consistent. That is that one cell is allocated on one side, but maybe in the other, for some reason, it is not allocated. And this can cause uh, problems such as losing connectivity between two nodes. And there's, there's many combinations of uh, possibilities, but they kind of fall into these two examples. The, the first one is when we have a transaction ongoing and the node uh, B, let's say in this in this figure, for some reason for some reason resets or power cycles and then it restarts. Uh, if this happens, uh, the inconsistency will be detected because of the sequence number of the node that resets turns to zero and then uh, this will be detected in the response message. While uh, another another case is when uh, we have a transaction and for some reason the the last the last link layer acknowledgement uh, fails, so we have the responses from from one of the sites and for some reason the acknowledgements are not received and after 
uh, as many retransmissions are configured, we cannot uh, acknowledge the message, then uh, that site detects that there's a, a possible inconsistency. Then in the text, we clarify how these inconsistencies are uh, addressed and we, we we just uh, outline uh, recommendations or we, we just indicate what can be done because we think that the scheduling function has to take the decision on what exactly do. Uh, one option, of course, is to reset the schedules and other options are like rollback the transaction. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, we finally, um, we clarified the error codes. We, we've gone through all the document. We tried to identify uh, all the cases where an error code is returned and we tried to make the text as clear as possible. And then we sorted them in this table, um, also considering whether they are just response codes not without meaning uh, that there's an error or if they are uh, of, the, of, of, or if, they have to be considered an error. So this is the list of uh, error codes that we have identified. And next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, about this uh, draft. As I said, it's, it's very stable and it's kind of in the last, in the last hop, I would say. So if you have any question. So thank you, Javi. Um, so I think this this also reflects uh, well what we discussed uh, in Prague, and all the changes that we have done after the plug test there. I th I know of at least two implementations that implement this version, although it's um, yeah I think yeah yeah can you say say something about ng is it is it this version or is it the previous version that that's implemented the previous version that's implemented okay. So we're waiting on, on one more implementation and to, to update this one. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, not, nothing really in particular, but uh, I, I would like to see the IoT there uh, come out, the IoT there. Uh, to do the review of this and see how it comes out. Like it just came in just before the meeting. Yeah. So I'm not gonna. So m most likely nothing's gonna happen to it until Christmas, I would think, right? Like so, um, two weeks of like IoT there, like in the reviews, and mm -hmm. um, if everything, if Zavi like you know turns around very very quickly, I can get a last call started and schedule it on telechat beginning of January. That's kind of like my okay. timeline. At this point. Okay. And I've seen that Samida sent the. Email to the IoT dear to uh, to ask for it. Right, and I think like she wanted um, uh, Six Law to take a look at it as well. Yeah, and uh, she asked me like you know should I tell Six Law? It's like yeah, you yeah. should, right? Like uh, as long more reviews are better mm -hmm. at any point of time. So like uh, she said like she'll just like pan it out and uh, see how things go. Right? Perfect. And like I, I took a quick look and things look okay to me, right? But um, I I'll wait for like uh, IoT to review as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Thank you, Javi. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Stay, stay, stay online because there's um, there's actually feedback from, if I remember correctly, from the MSF implementation about uh, about this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yep. So the next uh, presenter is Malisha. I don't know if Malisha, if you can hear us or see us. Uh, talking about minimal security, so the the, the one-touch security solution that builds on top of it. Uh, Marisha, is Marisha on the list? There you are. Yeah, we see you. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. All right, sorry about that. I forgot to join the queue and uh, enable the buttons. So the sound is good? Yeah, perfect, thank you. All right, great. So hello everyone, my name is Malisha. Uh, I will be presenting the status of uh, minimal security 
uh, draft, which is our one-touch solution to uh, secure enrollment in Sixfish Networks. So on October 30th, we published this, uh, the 04 version of minimal security. And the biggest change is that we now completely rely on pre-shared keys. That said, we uh, we had to remove the dependency on the ad hoc draft uh, that uh, had still uh, did not see any progress. So as of now, minimal security completely relies on pre-shared keys. And we will be addressing the asymmetric keys probably as part of the zero touch work. Uh, as part of this presentation, I will go through the main changes that we did from 03 to 04. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, so the, uh, the num update number one relates to the key nonce derivation process. And mainly as we heavily depend on OSCOR uh, spec that is being standardized in core. Uh, OSCOR is, was formerly, formerly known as OSCOAP. Uh, OSCOR went through, the, went through some changes when it comes to the key nonce derivations uh, process, which we had to adapt to. And uh, this was the reason why we had to do quite some changes in our draft. Uh, so right now in OSCOR, same nonce is used both for a request, join request and join response, but it is used under a different key. And uh, because of the way they construct nonces right now, uh, we could no longer use the concatenation of the uh, nodes uh, pledges identifier and uh, byte string 00 and 01 to differentiate between the pledge and the JRC. Uh, what, we did, what we do now is that we use pledges identifier as master salt during key derivation process. And then we transport this identifier EUI64 as a context hint uh, during uh, as part of the join request. I will present some sl more detailed slides just in a minute. And we use the different identifiers, of course, uh, for the pledge and the JRC. And this is plain simple. It's 00 for pledge and 01 for, for the JRC. I made some slides uh, to reflect some schematics to reflect this. Uh, they are presented in the next slide. Yes, so this is what uh, the key derivation process looks like. And this is uh, basically standardized in OSCOR and we instantiate this in minimal security. And as you can see, the first input to the key derivation function is the pre-shared key, uh, which is kept secret, of course. Uh, then uh, as master salt, we use pledges uh, identifier UI64 then a string key to differentiate between a key and the, uh, and the IV that is uh, subsequently being derived. Uh, and also there is the sender identifier. Uh, when this all is passed through a key derivation function, we obtain a join at the key that is used to protect the join request. And uh, for the join response, next slide please. Uh, what changes is only this sender identifier uh this sender identifier for the that corresponds now to the jrc but that but both nodes both. need uh, that both pledge and jrc need to, need to have of course and this with this we end up with the joint response key now when it comes to nonces and uh, as i said in o3 there was a difference between the nonce used for the joint request and the nonce used for joint response but since joint request and joint response use uh two different keys what OSCOR authors did in their spec is that basically now they use the same nonce for the request and the response. And this is how we instantiate these in minimal security, uh, where we, again, PSK is passed through the key derivation function together with the pledges identifier. Uh, this as the output gives a static uh, IV that is kept uh, on both sides. And then to construct the nonce for each request that comes uh, or a response, what happens is that this common IV is XORed with the sequence number together with the sender identifier of uh, the entity initiating the request. Next slide, please. So the second uh, major update was uh, regarding the error handling. And it turns out that the error handling in O3 would open the pledge to a denial of service attack. 
uh, where the attacker could send unprotected uh, co-op error messages uh, to the pledge, which would get accepted at the pledge. And this would force the pledge to attempt to joining the next advertised network. Uh, this was the case because uh, uh, in case uh, the pre-shared key is not present at the JRC or that the pledge is not authorized to join the network, uh, the error handling that we used previously would return an unprotected error code back to the pledge. Uh, now, of course, as this error code cannot be protected because the JRC and the pledge do not share a common context or the pre-shared key, the pledge, uh, it would be possible to spoof the error response and make the pledge join the next advertised network. And uh, what we did in 04 is that we went for uh, completely for silent, uh, silent drop of uh, any error codes. And uh, to do that, we use non-confirmable co-op message for join requests, which makes OSCOR at JRC silently drop the request in case of failure, which may happen for failed decryption, replay attack, or simply an unauthorized uh, pledge joining. Uh, so what we mandate now in minimal security is that uh, the pledge must silently discard any response not protected with OSCOR, including error codes. And this is to ensure that the client, or basically the pledge, does not accept any unprotected messages uh, uh, coming its way. Uh, this, this is also good from the point of view of intermediary state that uh, the join proxy keeps when it forwards the join request. Uh, because it minimizes this state that the proxy needs to keep in terms of co-op, in terms of the co-op implementation. So it fits very well with uh, what we wanted to have, basically the stateless, uh, stateless forwarding at the join proxy. But it forces the pledge to implement uh, a retransmission mechanism at the application layer, which basically duplicates co-op confirmable message functionality. And uh, next slide, please. Please, uh, Marisha. Yes, yes. This is Thomas clarifying question. Yes. Um, so, sorry, I, I didn't quite understand. So you the pledge sends a join request to the JRC that used to be confirmable, now it's non-confirmable. Yes, that's correct. Right? Yeah, that's right. Because the reason is, if I'm a pledge and I send a join request and some attacker sends me a join reply telling me, hey, you're not authorized, I'll believe it because it's not encrypted. I didn't get the keys yet. Correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And so so we say, okay, non-confirmable, so there's not nothing that comes back from the JRC. In correct? case of an error, yeah. In case of an error. Yeah. If okay. everything goes smoothly, we, we return as before, we return the join response. I see. Uh, uh, sorry, secured with the with join. Yes, of course. Key. Yes. Okay. So so if, if I'm a pledge and I send in a join request, if I get a join response, if everything is okay, I get a join response. If mm -hmm. something goes wrong, either I'm not authorized or just some, some communication goes wrong, then I don't yes. get anything back. So it's either a positive feedback or no feedback at all. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes, so, I understand that, Manisha, clarifying mm -hmm. again, sorry. Um, I understand that if there is some configuration error or something, the device will retry to death and then it will stop at some point, right? And yes, so, yes, so, exactly. so it, is, it is the responsibility of the, uh, the um, GRC to send some management here or to whatever management so to go and fix the device because there's nothing that will fix the device, right? So, yes, but so the, right, the problem the is that, that the GRC to notify that the non recoverable error has happened and tell an administrator of some form. Okay, so I see what you're saying. Basically, right now, as it is in the draft, the pledge would need to detect this. And we say that uh, upon a certain number of retries, the pledge should uh, signal to the user by an out-of-band mechanism the presence of an error condition. Which This is the statement that we have in minimal security. But your point is good that basically at the JRC side, if there are many attempts that fail, there should be a, this could be a, a sign of an attack or a misconfiguration 
of some pledge. So yeah, this is a good comment. This is something that we should that, probably add. That being, uh, this is Thomas. That being said, Pascal, I mean, this is regular. It doesn't require any protocol changes, right? No, no. It, it, well, there must be a management. Something should be written that the management even should be sent to whatever management console because I expect that many of those devices will not have an out-of-band channel to report the error. Yeah, I was Unless thinking of like LEDs or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this brings me to the so what we discussed just now uh, uh, forced us to implement basically the join request retransmission, which details a bit this uh, discussion that we just had. And uh, right now, what we do in minimal security is that we uh, uh, we mandate a binary exponential backup mechanism to be implemented the, the, by the pledge at the application layer. Uh, that kind of duplicates the co-op confirmable uh, functionality, but there, uh, we found no better way of doing this. And uh, so one, uh, one reason why we had to use the non-confirmable co-op is because of security. And the second reason is that it minimizes state at the proxy that is in the middle. And it relieves the proxy from keeping a state from many potential, uh, from many untrusted pledges, basically. And uh, the mechanism that we specified is uh, very simple. It's inspired by the one in the co op RFC in 7252. Uh, pledge only keeps track of a timeout and a retransmission counter. Uh, upon a timeout, uh, upon a uh, upon a timeout, it increments the retransmission counter and doubles the timeout. And we specify in the in the draft some uh, some default values. Uh, so, uh, so basically, uh, for the initial uh, timeout value, we use 10 seconds, which gives us on the first attempt timeout in 10 to 15 seconds. And at the very last attempt, by the default, by default, it gives us a timeout in 80 to 120 seconds. So I will be playing also with the simulator to uh, further confirm these values for a wide range of networks. Uh, but this, at the moment, I think they give a fairly confident uh, uh, number of uh, retries from the pledge point of view, and they are not too consuming in terms of energy, as there will be only four retries. Ma Other Manisha, than, yes. Sorry, a uh, question from Thomas. Um, mm -hmm. So, so now we do a we do non-confirmable co-op join request, and then we implement essentially something similar, not exactly, not the same, but something similar in the in the JRC to to confirm it essentially. At the pledge. Is it? I'm sorry. At the pledge. So the retransmission, because we have a proxy in the middle, right? So proxy yeah. statelessly forwards uh, the request yeah. when it receives the request from the pledge to the JRC. Yeah. There is no retransmission by using non-confirmable co-op. There is no. There will be no retransmission from proxy to the JRC. But what we do is that we mandate that the pledge initiates a new uh, initiates a retransmission in case it doesn't receive something uh, for uh, in this timeout. Okay. Yeah, let's just go offline because I have some weird ideas, but I'll get shot if I say them here. Okay. Let's just go offline. <laughs> yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, we added some recommendations to store untrusted neighbor entries in a separate cache, uh, as uh, there would be a possibility to flood the joint proxy with malicious pledges and basically do not, uh, do a denial of service on the uh, joint proxy. If the joint proxy would keep uh, the entries from the network and from the untrusted pledges in the same uh, neighbor table. Uh, we switched uh, the join request from get to post in order to be more flexible with payload in the join request uh, down the road. At the moment, we do not specify any payload uh, in the join request, but uh, it could be useful down the road. Uh, uh, further, we clarified some text on the persistency of mutable loss core context parameters, uh, which uh, ensures that uh, there is no non-reuse and replay attacks across reboots. 
And we also did uh, an extensive editorial pass, rewrote introduction, clarifications on the pre-shared key and many others. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as I said, we now completely rely on pre-shared keys. Uh, most of the changes in all four were due to the changes in OSCOR, uh, as well as this, uh, as this problem that we found with error handling. Uh, there is an ongoing thread on the mailing list about the about tagging joint traffic, which uh, unfortunately I, I kind of uh, I was uh, I didn't have much time. I had to context switch to minimal sc scheduling function, so I didn't have time to follow through. So you guys are probably more advanced than me on this, but uh, I will be uh, I will be going through this thread in the next days. And I think there is from what I could see briefly is that there seems to be a, re a resolution that we tag joint packets uh, at the joint proxy by using toss bits in IPv6 header. And uh, Pascal, if I understood correctly, there, th this would cost us one additional byte in the joint request packet. Right. I mean, there, there will be a default value that you don't need to indicate. So in the data packet, you would not see it for most normal data packet. But um, actually, this is a, a new weapon we have to, to improve the uh, the SF is if we have a different number of uh, CS or, or well, classes that uh, the, the SF recognizes, then it would have different treatments and maybe allocate more, allocate less, or in this case, allocate nothing, um, depending on the, on the class of, uh, of the packets. So if you use a default class, you use zero byte. If you want to indicate a class which is not the default, you will use one byte. Yeah. Okay. And I assume this will be opaque to the uh, regular IP routers as the join request uh, may cross uh, when it exits, exits the 60 boundary to get to, uh, in the case, GRC is in the cloud, it would cross regular routers, right? Oh, it, it's it's diff serve, right? So so the meaning mm -hmm. of, uh, of this byte is local. And mm -hmm. after that, it can be rewritten. Okay. All right. Sounds good. And yes, uh, we think the draft is fairly stable now, and we always welcome some further reviews. Uh, Rahul so, Jado from Huawei. Uh, you mentioned uh, in, pre in the previous slide, you mentioned about untrusted neighbor entries. So uh, there is a work going on in Elwig specifically to handle this particular case. It not only considers this case, but uh, it gives an example of EAP PANA, but the same applies there. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, we would like to have we would like to have you check that particular draft to check if this makes sense. You know? So the first uh, point recommendation to store untrusted neighbor yes. entries. So there is a draft in Elwig which specifically talks about maintaining neighbor entries mm -hmm. in six low band records. So maybe this this makes sense. Uh, this particular recommendation is already taken into consideration. Okay. Could you? Uh, I, I was not aware of that draft. Would could you send me a pointer? We'll do well, that. Use the mailing list, please. Yeah, we'll do yes, that. Please. Yeah. All right, great. M Malisha, um, as chairs, yep. we, we care about, you know, when this document will be ready for less call. Mm -hmm. And we wonder if you think that considering minor additions that are discussed now, your next ver version would be, from your standpoint, ready for workgroup less call. Can we expect to do workgroup less call soon? Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. So, uh, so we need to take care of the. So basically, the to tag the joint traffic, a, a joint proxy. This is the major addition that we do. And other than that, I mean, it should be ready. So I will be doing uh, so soon uh, a new version, and I think we should go for the working group last call after that. There is one thing, Malisha, is that you have a normative dependence on the score. Yes, so this is another thing. So OSCORE is in a working group last call at core at the moment. So I think um, my personal opinion is that uh, minimal security should go to ISG hand in hand with OSCORE. Uh, hi, hi, Malaysia, you're on Selander. Yes. Uh, it, it, OSCORE is not yet in working group last call. There was, a, uh, there was like a pre-working group last call call. So oh, they asked, okay. is there any problems with this going to working group last call? So, but the meeting is tomorrow, so we know more about it tomorrow. Oh, OK, OK, I apologize. I misunderstood that. So uh, before Suresh, I mean, can you please, um, do you think there is a chance that at this point there is a major change in OSCORE that would impact this document? 
Not, not that I know of. No. Yeah, Suresh Krishna. So I, I think it's going to be very challenging to like synchronize these two drafts. So if, if you think you want OS, OS code to be done before you ship this off, just wait in it in the working group, right? Like so, um, I I cannot do cross area synchronization of drafts. If it's like multiple things that are my groups, then I can manage to do it, right? But okay. I would say if you're worried about like any changes in Oscar, just wait for it to get through. I can hold on to it like until that happens, but it's probably just going to be me gating. There's no, there's no, nothing that's going to be synchronized between these two. Like we can put one of them ahead of another, but that's about it. Yes, I mean Oscar definitely is, is the dependency, so Oscar has to progress before, but we don't want to wait for Oscar to be an RFC before we can progress. Oh no, no, not for RFC. Like, but like if you wait for it to be shipped out of the working group, because like yeah. there could be changes at any point that could break us. Right, it's only a uh, major change, but yeah. Right, so um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some changes after it leaves the working group, right? Like this ITF last call on IESG. I'm sure there's something so that's going to happen. So uh, if, if you want like it to be baked, then I suggest you wait for that to get baked, or just send it off, and we can probably resync again, right? Like once they both go through the IESG process, if something breaks, like I can probably tell you like what has changed, and then we can go from there. So okay. there's different ways forward. And and another question I had is like. Um, What's the status of like, you know, the ad hoc and OS co-op like stuff? I thought this was like for minimal security, right? Like, so I'm, I don't see anything in the draft. So I'm just trying to figure out like, is the dependency still there? Uh, so basically we removed the dependency on ad hoc in the in 04 version. Uh, and this has a consequence that we no longer support uh, certificates for enrollment. We strictly rely on pre-shared keys now. And by doing this, we uh, we could uh, remove the dependency on ad hoc and re completely rely on a score. Okay, that, that that's good for me to know, right? Like because um, this is like really uh, three area cross area stuff, right? Like, and if that's not a dependency, that's like very like useful input for me. So that's uh, then I, I don't mind like just uh, like the working group shipping it off to me, and then I'll I'll figure out like you know how to get back. So, okay. Because but, I, I think that was like the big thing that that was like um, we haven't figured out yet. Like because there's like a, a dependency on ACE as well for that to mm -hmm. happen. So uh, if, if that's not a dependency for this version of the draft, we can just go ahead with it. Yes. Yes. So we removed this dependency, but as part of sixth dish, uh, I uh, I mean I'm speaking on on my personal uh, as uh, on my personal behalf. Uh, I, we would want probably to have uh, a secure enrollment uh, that supports certificates, and we would need something uh, similar to ad hoc down the road. So, I mean, we still want to do that at some point in time. From Michael on the mic says, uh, Zero Touch joints still use certificates and could depend upon ad hoc. I got it. I got it from your computer. But yes, thank you. I have one last question about the toss bits. Uh, you say when we update uh, minimal security, but I think that the tagging with the toss bits and mapping the different levels that the toss bits give us to different traffic may, may be a different draft rather than this one or should be the same. I, I think you need to indicate which class you're going to use, and that's that's about it. And for the rest, it has to be somewhere else. But you need to indicate that you're using a class, and that must be in the packet. And and you also need to indicate that it goes into the if there is IP in IP, then it goes into the inner, the one which is uh, compressed by 6282 as opposed to 6 layer H, because 6 layer H cannot transport the the, the class. Okay. Thank you, Malisha. All right. Thanks. So uh, next, we're switching from one touch to zero touch. Um, then it's minus one is in touch. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> Mike, Michael, do you hear us?
I think you can press the button. He's in the queue. No, he he, he, he entered the queue. You're on, Michael. Hello. Hello. Yes, I like that. Minus one touch. So that's really good. And also, we should have imaginary touch for complex devices um, in the complex plane. So um, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, the zero touch effort. Um, and next slide. Thank you. Um, so the 01 version was uh, posted on October 30th on the, the last date there. Um, the 00 version had synchronized with the Anna Mabruski 07 draft that was at IETF 99. So the approach that I took was essentially to, um, with we discussed the renaming last time, was to essentially wipe out the entire draft, pull the table of contents in from the Bruski document, and then essentially make this a sort of delta draft so that the document, so it says, unless there's a specific, uh, something specific in, Z in six tish join that's different than Bruski, it would be identical, but that the table of contents is uh, one for one so that you can go back and forth and say, you know, what's, how is it different? The document is intended to be read, you know, more or less standalone, but you are intended to, to have read Bruski. So with 09, uh, the Bruski 09 document, we, there were some changes to the document. And so the zero touch document resynchronized the table of contents, um, fleshed out a great number of text. Um, it includes the Yang module, which is translated by the um, uh, core Yang Seabor uh, mechanism into um, uh, uh, ownership vouchers that we need to establish ownership. Um, the uh, this has been done manually. If you were in the core session a couple hours ago, then I guess there's now new complicated automated mechanisms to do this. Um, and that will be great as soon as they become stable. Um, uh, so this document uses an experimental SID value of 60,100. And uh, we need to get the SID document and the registry created to uh, be able to uh, make any progress here. And I think that they're about to, uh, to do that pretty quickly. Um, <clears throat> we had this big lunch uh, at IETF 99 in Prague to try and sort out ad hoc and OS core and DTLS and all this stuff. Um, I, I, I don't think it was particularly successful um, in the end. Um, and I don't think we really have a really good idea of, of what will happen to ad hoc, if anything. So at this point, I'm writing the document on the assumption that it may live on top of DTLS um, or uh, ad hoc or some other security if someone came up with a new thing. Um, you, you have a question? So, Hi, Michael. You're on the London. Yeah. Yes, just, go just ahead. A, just on state of ad hoc. So, so what's what's in what's going on right now is that there is a comparison between, in terms of overhead, between uh, the TLS handshake or DTLS handshake and and ad hoc. Mm -hmm. and, and we are we didn't manage to do it in time for this meeting, so we will either have an interim or some sort of summary in, the, in between this meeting and next meeting, where we have all the figures on the table. We have a proposal for for how the TLS 1.3 over co-op would look like. I'm just a handshake. And right. uh, how, how large that would be in comparison to ad hoc and then match that against your requirements in terms of sizes of frames and, and so on. So that that's the plan. Right. So, so, so that would be a DTLS over co-op is, uh, is one of the dot, dot, dots extra additional possibilities as opposed to DTLS under co-op, which is uh, we already know how to do, right? Yeah, yeah. It's going, it's going to be two concrete proposals, which we care. One is with, which we compare. One, one which which is based on a uh, TLS handshake, and one which is based on ad hoc. And then we'll, we're going to match that and have a discussion uh, based on on your requirements on number of messages and so on. So Thank that's you. The, that's that's, that's wonderful. Uh, um. So so, but just just as a little aside, one of the things that I realized in in implementing is that. Um, DTLS, if uh, you know, has a actually a, a, con, uh, a 
de distributed denial of service attack um, uh, mitigation thing that involves an extra round trip. Um, and so that would be one of the things, for instance, that we would have to decide if we're going to turn on all the time or turn or disable or uh, exactly what. Um, so my last point is that I, I saw that the Chider update says that we're going to do, do this by October 2018. And I'm pretty sure that we can we can beat that because my my feeling is that although this has sat in the wings for a long time, it now has the right steam to uh, advance quickly. Um, uh, uh, assuming that that we figure out what security belongs underneath it. Um, next slide, please. There are a bunch of other dependencies and other works. Um, so, for instance, um, there is dependencies in the core working group um, involving SID, as I just mentioned, and the Yang stuff. Um, there is um, a document that's currently in would like to be an ACE, um, which describes how to run uh, EST over co-op. And it would be silly to repeat that document in this document. Um, and there is a uh, reluctance to merge the two documents at this point. Um, so uh, because they're, they're believed, it is believed that there are quite a number of uses of EST over co-op, which are not related to Sixtish or uh, any of the IoT stuff. Um, I'm still trying to understand what that what that set of things is, um, but th that's part of it. Um, so then we also have some documents, even in this work group, that this work uh, has uh, outsourced to, um, and they're not adopted either. Um, so uh, right now I'm the primary author. I would be very happy to have additional co-authors who want to actively contribute or who are even writing code, that would be great. Um, but I am making significant progress on the document, so I'm not terribly worried about that. That's all I have today. Yep. Okay. This, is, <clears throat> this is Peter van der Stok. It's about EST Co-op S. I hope to have a meeting to with uh, Hannes and some others to discuss how we go to handle this EST Co-op S. And if this should be two separate documents or if they keep them all together and uh, well we'll keep you informed okay yeah i'm i feel confident that you will figure it out and that we'll have a document to refer to very soon thank you any other questions thank you michael um so we're switching. We're going into scheduling function territory now. Uh, Diego, I hope your issues are resolved. I hope you can hear us. Hi. Yeah, um, perfect. There you go. Let's see if the video works. There you go. OK. Um, well, I'm Diego. Um, I'm the editor of Draft IET, IETF 66 top SFX. And can you move next, please? How, how can you move it? Okay, thank you. So the the idea is that we are this this is uh, the work that continues uh, the work that we have started on the on the fly scheduling and scheduling function zero uh, SF zero, and um, this was. Um, the, the original one had a full experimental results, okay, meaning that we had a, a, a paper on, on this, okay, and then we had a, some recommendations that in the last version we have changed uh, for in the fundamental um, uh, algorithm that uh, adds or, or releases the results. The so the recommendations were first to resubmit SF0 as, as, as experimental, so we changed the name to SFX, and then to provide a list of requ uh, requested experimental results. So to establish a range of values or uh, uh, the, the values of each of the constants you have used within the, the, the draft. Next, please. Clarifying question. Did you make sure there is no leftover SF0 in the draft? Because maybe there are. As far as I can remember, okay, they, we, we say that the, this is the experimental version of SF0, in fact. There is one on the screen. Sorry? 
there is, there is one the draft that the, 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 the SFX is the experimental version of SS of zero. Sorry, yes. So, um, yes, yes, we, you, are, you are still using SF0 because this is the only experimental version of it. Um, then, uh, we uh, uh, the, uh, the request is the defined values of, of for over provisions, uh, SF0 threshold, and the other ranges. Okay, so as to the to that or delete the, the under the on the education policy. And then we want to analyze the study the scheduling stability and the oscillation because that's the, the main issue when uh, when you are trying to, to define how many cells you are going to define or to, to, to add or to delete on one side or the other to, to avoid a uh, fracture. And uh, that's one of the features that SFX has. And next, please. To define a, the a PDR value below the average, which is most effective, in fact, for blacklisting cells, and also to whitelist them, and then to analyze the, the stability, because of the we have we've been working mostly on the on the idea that uh, there's a percentage of them that it should be added or deleted, but we, we want to to understand how many should be deleted or added, and then the uh, and measure the this distribution of of cell scheduling delay. Okay, and that way, and meaning that if you are, we are going to add more delay, okay, when, when we just distribute in, in different ways, or to add more instances of the same of the, to, to the same neighbor on the same scale. And next, please. So um, we have undergone a, a detailed uh, review uh, in May the, before ITF ninety nine, okay, and. Um, and the corrections were submitted, of course, on SF005. Then, so my question is: Is it, is it if it is ready for WGLC? Okay, the last last call. That's it. Any questions for Diego? So, I, Diego, I I I, I yeah. reread the draft uh, in the plane. Um, yeah. So I, 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 I have a couple of uh, editorial comments and I'm happy yeah. to work with you uh, on, on fixing those. Um, uh, it, it does state in some 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 places SF0, SF0, SF0. So I think just uh, it's just a typo, typos that need to be um, that need to be fixed. Um, and also, I mean, um, it's probably entirely our fault. But at the beginning, we started talking about SFs by their number, mm -hmm. SF0, SF1. Um, I, th I mean, we we're changing our minds uh, because it, it's we get stuck with those numbers and we're kind of assigning I IANA numbers before before anything has happened. So mm -hmm. uh, we now have four SFs: uh, ASF, MSF, uh, five SF one, SF zero, and another one. Um, what what I'd like to suggest to scheduling function authors is to name their scheduling functions not by a number, but by some name. Uh, like MSF is minimal scheduling function, ASF is autonomous, okay. autonomic, autonomic scheduling function. So, um, so SFX SFX is 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 fine. But but I mean, it, it tr throughout the text you're referring mm -hmm. to is as SF or SFID zero. Okay. I think we need to. To follow the process to do I you know, let Diana uh, uh, assign this uh, is 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 silly, but for example, for SF one it, it applies as well. Okay, but le, le, um, I propose that we we work together, you and me, uh, Diego, and 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 your co-authors. Okay, uh, I can chapter it if you want, and then we we just get the, get this out. And so we have to work for that. We I'm sorry, we have to wait for that uh, editorial uh, update before we can consider work group last call. I I believe. Hi, uh, Thomas. Leo Thomas asked if he uh, has uh, Diego, if you have some experimental results currently available, like uh, in terms of stability. Do you have some experimental results? That we are we are we asking for okay the, on on SFX. That's why it's, why it is experimental. Uh, we had already the, the the original ones okay that were published published for the former version, but it's not uh, for the new version. Okay, we have changed. Uh, the 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 main uh, uh, allocating algorithm. Okay, we don't have it them yet. 
if you have them, we are uh, grateful if you, uh, you have tested it. You can even use the OpenWSN code. It has a part of SFX implemented over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and uh, given that it's experimental, this is this is fine. So uh, Simon is typing. ASF stands for Autonomous SF. Thank you, Simon. Autonomous San Francisco. I assume. I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> thank you, Diego. Thank you for waking up uh, early. I know it's, it's early. It's five fifty. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the next presenter is uh, Ting Fei Chang, who will present MSF, Minimal Scheduling Function. It's remote as well. Uh, Ting Fei, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear and even see you. Oh, great. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ting Fei, and I'm coming from the Ingria, Paris, uh, from France. I'm going to present the six station minimals scaling function, which is MSF. So, um, okay. Uh, so the MSF is a, uh, is a scaling function on, on the top of the 6B, and uh, the job that defines uh, when I'm joining the work and how the communication schedule is managed in the real the fashion. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. If you please, could you hold your mic a little bit closer? Because this time it's a bit low. Yeah, uh, is that so far now? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, uh, next. Okay, um, so first, because the MSF is trying to using the minimal cell defined in the minimal uh, RFC, so we define some way to leverage the traffic on the minimal cell. Uh, first, uh, we define the different types to allow sending on the minimal cell. Uh, which is e enhanced begins, deals, and the join request and respond message between the plug and a uh, drone proxy. And also the 6P transaction which, uh, before the node have a dedicated cell installed. Uh, and also we limit the traffic on minimal cell uh, for the enhanced begin or deals. It's only allowed to transmit uh, 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 with a ratio of one divided by three times n plus one, where n is the number of neighbor. Uh, and the, so the traffic on the minimal cell will uh, no more than um, two third. And the rest of them are used for the drone uh, process and uh, the 6B. And uh, MSF uh, defined two cell frame, and cell frame zero is for minimal cell, and one is uh, the for the cell added by the MSF. Next slide, please. Uh, ne next slide. There, yeah. There's a delay. Oh. We're on slide uh, five. Okay. Uh, so f first, the the behavior for node when after is. There are three states, and first the start states, the node has a pre-shared key, and it will go through the drone process, which is defined in the minimal security. And then it goes to the seven steps to join, and at the end of state, a node should synchronize the network, and it is also using the link uh, layer king it get from the drone proxy, uh, from, from the drone process. And the node should also uh, have a preferred road in parents, and it also has a, a dedicated cell to its uh, preferred uh, road in parents. Uh, so after that, the node is uh, allowed to sending the deals and enhance beacon for uh, serving as a router of the other nodes and also the draw proxy for the new joining nodes. Uh, next slides, please. Okay, so for the step to um, bef from start to the end state, it has seven steps. First, uh, and after a node boot, it's a random choose the frequency to listen to the EBs. And step two, the node will listen for multiple neighbors and choose one as the drone proxy. And step third, uh, it will uh, go through the, uh, the drone proxy 
uh, drone process uh, according to the uh, secure uh, secure drone process. Uh, after the node drone, and we will listen for deals to require a a IPL rank to select uh, a preferred parents. And then step five, uh, the six P will yield to adding a single cell uh, with the, the set the cell option uh, where the bit TX, RX, and shared bit set. And it will add, uh, use this 6P add uh, packet uh, sent to their parents to reserve one uh, dedicated cell. And after the node has a one dedicated cell, uh, the node starts sending the enhanced beacon and deals. And meanwhile, the node should uh, send the keep alive to their neighbors uh, every 10 seconds to to see if their neighbors still active, active, active. So if not, we we'll remove the cell to that neighbors. Uh, next slide, please. Mm, okay. Uh, so after the end of state, the node will start the uh, the scheduling function. So there are three reasons to changing the schedule. Uh, first, uh, either ad for adapting to traffic or switching of parents or handling schedule collision. And all of them are um, done through the 6P packet. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So first, uh, first reason for adapting the traffic. Uh, first of all, a node always has at least one cell to their parents, uh, which means there will be two. One is uh, one dedicated cell reserved by uh, scaling function, one minimal cell. And, and also we keep two counters uh, to the preferred parents, number of cell passed, uh, which we're counting how many uh, dedicated cell has passed. And also the number of cell used. So this is well counting when there's a, a packet needs to transmit on the dedicated cell. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter the the transmission successful or not. But uh, it will plus one when there's a packet need to send. Uh, and the decision is made when the number of cells is passed to re as number of cell passed to reach is sixteen. So when number of cell used is greater than 12, we add a cell. And uh, if it's less than four, we remove cell. Take care, yes. I, I got a off, offline recommendation. Uh, num cells passed mm -hmm. is, is uh, I think, uh, I think it's better to say num cells elapsed, just an English thing. Mm -hmm. Anyways, um, yeah. we'll have to fix that. I'll take that. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So, when uh, a node switched uh, its parents, you would do three things. First, it counts the number of cells to its uh, previous parents, then schedule the same number to the new parents, and then it's remove all the cells from the older parents. And uh, for handling the collision, next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we are counting, um, we are detecting the schedule collision depending on the PDRs, the relative PDRs. So if one PDR of one cell is 50% less than the cell with maximum PDR, we relocate it. And uh, to calculate PDR, we use two counters, one is the norm TX and norm TX ACK which is if the transmission is act, uh, and they always plus, all plus one when the transmission happens and there's the act replies. When number of TX uh, reach to 256, uh, and the post counter should uh, left sh uh, right shift uh, one bit, which is divide two. Uh, so actually the ratio between them doesn't change. Um, and this is a relocation only happens when uh, the normal TX reached 
one uh, 256 one time at least to make sure the PDR is uh, 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 has uh, uh, enough statistic. Uh, I see you have there's a question. Yeah, there's a question. Yes, we have a question in slide eight. If we can go, please, slide eight. And you ask, uh, how did you define those values? Like 16, 12, 4. How do you define yeah. those values? Yeah, the six is a number uh, which can uh, change. So the, the main reason is that once there is a 75% of the cell are used, we add a cell. And if there are less than 25% cell, uh, used, we remove cell. So 16, 12, 4, this is a, a relative number. It's not uh, uh, arbitrary. It, it's a uh, well uh, toned depending on the experiment results. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so we should go to the other detail slides. Yeah. Uh, so there's other details uh, defining the MSF. So the CP signal command, uh, MSF didn't use it. A rule for cell list, um, the cell are randomly chosen. And the CP timeout value is depending on the PDR of the link from node to their parents. And also a factor. And so the rule for ordering cell, we order the cell in the cell list by their uh, slot uh, offset. And uh, there's no mm, further metadata field, we didn't use it. And uh, we also defined four actions to handle in different 6 p error code. And uh, the inconsistent uh, handling, we already described it. So uh, this is the whole MSF uh, draft uh, generally about. And uh, uh, we proposed it two weeks ago, and we did a, a simulation and uh, experimentation to to, uh, to see the very first uh, result for the MS, MSF. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, before we, we go into the simulation, thank mm -hmm. I, if yeah. I may. So you've seen that we have been discussing for the joint process that will uh, we'll, we'll put, we'll, we'll use the class field of the IPv6 header uh, to, s to tag at least the joint process and, and it has to be consistent with what this, the SF does. So there will be a need to add some text in MSF to say for this class, the number are 4, 75, 4, uh, 12 and 16 and you increment by one or decrement by one, but that's for class blah. And for, for well, maybe you don't say for a particular class, but for a range of classes, right? So yeah. we can work that out on the mailing list, but there will be an addition that will be needed there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is the simulator imitation done by Malisha, and uh, the uh, source code is uh, uh, indicated by the link uh, under the title. Um, the big figure in, in the middle is uh, what it looks like for the, when the simulator is running. And uh, uh, we did this uh, for 100,000 solar firm cycles. And uh, 50 nodes are chosen and randomly deployed in a two by two kilometer area. And each node has at least three neighbors. Uh, so we got some results uh, on the right. And I want to see how MSF can converge. Um, uh, so with this, the figure on the right top, and you can see there's a, uh, the, the uh, yes. There is a question for Simon. Um, if the cells of two prefix, prefer parents are for transmission only or are also for reception? Uh, it's uh, they send from the bi-direction. Bi it's for transmission and also uh, receiving. But uh, but the, it's a, a TX, RX, and shares a lot, but it's only shared by the node and its parents. 
Okay, thank you. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Yi Chao from Toshiba. Hello, Tenfei. Uh, Hello. So, uh, in your algorithm, when you uh, consider the case of switching parents and you have to adjust your schedule, so for example, uh, if a node has, for example, 20 child nodes, mm -hmm. and then that node switches parents, does your scheduling algorithm still like re you know, remove sales one by one, and then in other case, you will add sales one by one, like right? it's uh, slide eight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so in that, so in your dynamic scheduling, you basically when, so if the traffic changes gradually, I think your algorithm works very well. But in the case of a node switch parents, which that node has many child node. Yeah. And then that probably cause a problem if you uh, do it one by one. I think that's slide nine, no? Yeah, it's really next one. Next. All right. Yeah, so. All right, all right. right. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's switching is uh, from the node to their children, it's switching. But if the node has more children, it doesn't change uh, anything between the node and these children because um, uh, it doesn't affect that part, right? Because uh, our, the, our changing apparent, if I have four cell in my local and this four cell is for my children, uh, uh, it's to, to their parents rather than to their children. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Right. Okay, Melissa made as well a comment mm -hmm. that uh, say what we count the number of cells with the old parents and add the same number of cells with the new one in a single six bit transaction. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That clarifies it. Thank you. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, Okay, and also we do we did a, a real deployment on IoT Lab. Um, we, we implemented in the two weeks uh, with a MS uh, app code sprint, and we deployed a certified nodes on the Sakli IoT Lab lab site, and we have some uh, preliminary results uh, on the bottom left. The first one. Uh, it's showing how the rank is involved during time. Uh, you can see the node rank is very sto uh, stay stable after join. And uh, in the middle, we calculate uh, the end-to-end -end reliability. So on most nodes, so almost all of them reached uh, 100%. And uh, for the duty cycle, all the nodes are averagely below 1%. So this is on the traffic uh, um, with only uh, one, uh, the node will send one packet every minute. So the only uh, most of them only have one uh, dedicated cell in their schedule. So it makes sense uh, all of them are average below 1%. Uh, next slide. If you could keep it within one minute. Mm -hmm. So this is so with this uh, result, uh, running result, we have some corruption. And first, it uh, it works, and also simple to implement. And we have the broadcast uh, strategy on the minimal cell, and the, it's uh, indeed to leverage the traffic on, on minimal cell it helps for the join and also help for the six B uh, transaction. And uh, there's something we also need to figure out is how to set the MS. Uh, parameters as function. Uh, and also we have some uh, 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 knowledge we learned from the implementation. Uh, so when a schedule in inconsistency is detected, the CSP clear request and uh, respond uh, should uh, be exchanged on the minimum cell because uh, it, if there is a schedule in consistent, uh, uh, consistency there, uh, if it's keep standing on the delegate cell, it may just doesn't work. And also we need a limited backup exponents on the delegate cell because we're only shared by two nodes. Uh, yeah, and also we need a further experimental uh, based on application scenario. 
Yeah. Is it, you have a question? Yeah. Um, this is uh, Charlie Perkins. I have a question. What is it that causes uh, the schedule inconsistency? Is that, I mean, what, what causes it to arise? So, or is there more than one cause? Uh, the schedule inconsistency? Yes. So, Charlie, I propose that we're running out of time. I propose okay, that you and me have, fine. this is a, a, a 6 P question. I'm, I'm happy to answer, to have a chat with you. It takes two minutes. Ruth. Fine, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, last, please. Okay. They go to Jopne, say, uh, would it be nice to see traffic bars conditions on the experiments? Traffic bars yeah. condition? Bars. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's, so this is a very uh, premier, uh, preliminary result, and we will do that. Uh, in the simulator, it shows that and it, it works well. Uh, but uh, I agree we need to do on experiments. We, we, we have to do those those experiments, yeah. Agreed. Yeah. So, that's all. Thank you, Deng Fei, and, and congratulations to you and Malisha for implementing this in two weeks. Uh, it's impressive. Thank you. Thank you. So we're running a little bit out of time. Uh, next presenter is Remy, talking about SF1. Hello, uh, Remy here. So what is SF1? So uh, SF1 is uh, a scheduling function to reserve a track to a destination multiple hops away in order to fulfill the bandwidth and the queues requirements of the sender. And the track reservation is conducted uh, hop by hop in a, in a distributed manner. And basically, uh, SF1 is a combination of RSVPTE and the 6P, in which uh, uh, RSVPTE is used for end-to-end resource uh, reservation and uh, 6p is used for the cell negotiation between uh, two neighbors and uh, sf1 is triggered in two uh, situations the first one is when the sender has a uh, new instance to transmit the data to the receiver the second one is when the sender has new uh, requirements for an existing instance and uh, in the end uh, to end uh, perspective once SF1 is triggered, the sender should send a pass message uh, hop by hop downstream to the receiver. And, the, and uh, uh, upon receiving the, uh, the pass message, the receiver should uh, verify, uh, should uh, initiate a 6P transaction to verify if there are enough cells uh, to fulfill the requirements. And if so, the the receiver uh, should send back should send the reserve message to reserve these cells. And uh, for an intermediate node, uh, upon receiving the uh, uh, reservation message, uh, the the node should reserve the uh, the cells in one hop uh, in the same way as in step two. And finally. When the res res uh, reservation message arrives at the sender uh, before the end to end timeout, a track from the sender to the receiver is uh, built successfully. And the pass and the reserve message is defined in uh, RSVP. Uh, we have done minor extensions to this message formats. And uh, the pass message includes the uh, Sender to spec objects to describe the flow and uh, the uh, add spec objects to uh, collect the pass properties. And uh, we use three uh, uh, request objects to verify if uh, the node along the road have the, uh, have the request capabilities. That, that is the time slot switching capability and uh, the SF1 and the 6P capabilities. And uh, for the return message, it includes uh, uh, the flow spec object to describe the bandwidth and the queues requirements, and uh, the label object to uh, assign the label to the uh, upstream node. And the parameters in the flow spec uh, object are calculated 
according to the sender T spec and the add spec in the pass message. And in case of uh, three step transaction, the 6P confirmation message is encapsulated in the 6P uh, uh, operation object. Uh, in one half perspective, uh, uh, in in two neighbor nodes, we note we note the upstream node as node A and the downstream node as node B. Uh, the one half reservation is triggered by the arrival of pass message if node B is uh, the receiver or by the arrival of reser reservation message if uh, node B is an intermediate node. And then node B should map the bandwidth to a number of cells and uh, the queues to uh, constraints on cells. For example, uh, the slot frame and uh, uh, slots offsite, et cetera. And, uh, and then node B should initiate the, the, the 6P transaction uh, with node A to uh, verify if there are some uh, qualified cells. If the answer is positive, uh, uh, node B should transmit the, the uh, reserve uh, message to, uh, to node A. Once uh, the reservation message arrives at uh, node A, the cells between these two nodes are reserved and the label is also assigned. And more details can be found in this state transition diagram. And uh, the uh, and uh, uh, node A uh, uh, and uh, the one half uh, cell reservation is triggered by the aforementioned conditions. And uh, then node B should conduct the curved mapping to find some qualified uh, salt frames. If uh, there is no uh, qualified salt frames, the reservation fails. And uh, uh, node B should send the reserve error to the receiver. And uh, the current reservation is maintained. So uh, if there are some uh, qualified slot frames, uh, node B should initiate the 6P transaction on one of them. And uh, if, uh, uh, if this, the, the transaction fails or uh, timeout time happens in this 6P transaction, uh, node B can initiate uh, uh, a new uh, 6P transaction uh, on a backup slot frame. And um, uh, uh, if, if, if backup slot frame exists, of course, if no, uh, the reservation fails. And if the 6P transaction succeeds, node B should uh, transmit uh, the reserve message to, um, to, to node A and the uh, reservation between these two nodes is updated. And we have updated the definitions for the track ID and the label uh, in, in, the current, in the latest version. Uh, so the track ID currently is uh, 16 bits in Dantifer. It is assigned by the, uh, by the, by the sender and uh, the track ID is mapped uh, from the tuple uh, source and destination IP addresses repo instance, and the track ID is encapsulated in the Cinder uh, template uh, object of pass message and the filter spec of return message. And the label is uh, 32 bits. It is mapped from uh, a band of cells between uh, two neighbor nodes, and it is encapsulated in the label object of uh, reserve message. It is locally validated between uh, two neighbors and assigned by the uh, downstream node. The label uh, is associated to a track uh, when the return message is transmitted upstream. So for the next step, we'll, we will complete the definition of uh, 6P and, uh, of, of SF1 uh, to cover some uh, objects and, uh, uh, and the message formats. And of course, uh, there is a gap to be covered, uh, which is how to map the traffic requirements to to number of cells and the constraints on cells. And um, we will also cover the items uh, according to the suggested outline of uh, uh, SIGTAP. And uh, most important is we are going to work on the implementation to like the running code to support our draft. Uh, thank you, any comments? Uh, thank you, we, we're, we're running out of time, uh, so I propose that we take, uh, I have a, a bunch of comments and a bunch of clarifying questions, but I, I propose that we do the discussion on the mailing list right now. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you, Otama. Thank you very much. And with this, we are at the, not the top of the hour, but at like the, at the end of the meeting. Um,
Any other business before we close the meeting? Okay, Harry, nothing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. We need the blue sheets. Can you please, uh, everybody has signed the blue sheets? If so, can you please circulate the blue sheet all the way to here? I don't know where they are. Everybody signed them? Remy, can you please stay? Okay, so thank you very much all for, for the participation. And for the remote people to wake up very early in the morning. Thank you, Tero, for being with us. I can never thank you so much. Let's move. Close this.